Hey guys, welcome back to Founder Story, where you learn the genesis of your favorite brands told by their founders. I'm Dan Larson, creator and host of Founder Story. This is season one, episode three, with Nick Wood from Colo. On this episode, you'll learn how Nick went from being a successful door-to-door salesman to starting his own tech company with no prior experience in computer science. Just a lot of hustle and some serious salesmanship. First, music from Andrew Apple Pie. Andrew is the best. He allows me to use his music on my episodes every week. Go support him. He's an independent artist. Purchase his music at andrewapplepie.com. On uh, this week's episode of Founder Story, I am joined by Nick Wood from Colo. Nick, thanks for joining the podcast. Hey, thanks so much. Appreciate you having me. So for our listeners, um, tell us a little bit about what Colo is. So at Colo, what we do is is we take startups, we take their ideas, um, and we build them apps in eight weeks is kind of our goal. So we take uh, app startups from idea to market in eight weeks. And the theory behind that is, well, we use we use the software that we built with some custom coding. And the theory is, if we can get you to market as a startup quick, um, then you're going to be able to, in theory, get to revenue quicker. And once you get to revenue in the start in this startup life, it's it's life becomes a lot easier. It's easier to raise money. Um, it's easier to focus on building a great product and not trying to do things in the short term to bring in money. But so yeah, we. We are a platform that launches app startup ideas, but we do it very quickly. And because of that, we can put people on a really cool payment model where Mm -hmm. they can just pay us a little bit of money each month instead of paying this big $100,000 that most companies charge right out the gate. We can have you pay us a monthly fee that's nominal really compared to these other ones. And, uh, and go in and prove to the world that your business uh, can change the world, really. That's great. So let's maybe go back to the beginning. Uh, tell us what was going on in your life when you decided to start this company and maybe prior to starting this company. What was what was happening? So I spent four years prior to starting Colo selling uh, home security systems door to door, which for many people that are listening to this, are, well, they have their thoughts and their uh their, their preconceived notions about that. And they're thinking, holy cow, that's terrible. And uh, <laughs> yeah, in some respects it kind of was, but um, it was good money and, and the skills that I was learning, I just couldn't learn anywhere else. So it was, it was just part of part of my story. But yeah, you learned how to hustle, right? How to work yeah, hard and, and make it happen. Yeah, I think that's absolutely. fantastic. So yeah, so I got in, I got into this home security door-to-door sales really with the idea of I can do this during the summer and I can make enough money so that during the off season I can start a business and which was my ultimate goal. And I mean, theoretically it was awesome. I make the money, I'll run the business for eight months, kind of put it on autopilot, which now you realize that's probably not even, there's no business you can really do that. But I thought there was right. Um, and then I'd go back out if I needed more capital and I just had a quick way to make capital. So I started doing this and I did that for three years. I did it for four years total, but after three years, I ended up having the year three, 2015, I had the best summer and year financially and everything of my life. So when you look at it from like my regionals perspective, they probably were really confused because I should have just been really sold and just really drinking the Kool-Aid, but I wasn't, I was unhappy. And I always knew that it just, every single year I was in it, Mm -hmm. it just pain me to see, I would see my checks and I'd see my guys checks and I knew that I was making some good money. My guys were making good money. And so, but what about the guys above me? They were making great money. What about the owner? And so I just kept thinking, man, 
if I'm doing something, I'm always the type of guy that's going to go 100% all in on it yeah, and put all this effort, but it just didn't, I, I just couldn't wrap my head around putting all this effort and all this work into something that at the end of the day, I was only going to benefit for that year and I'd have to do it all over again the next year. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So you kind of, you're doing well, but you wanted to set your sights even, even higher and, and do better than you had in, in the past, even after kind of a, a record breaking year for yourself. Right. Right. And, and long term, it was a long term goal. And, and I'd seen a lot of guys that got into the industry and they'd stuck for 12, 15 years, which I'm not saying that's a bad thing. If, I mean, it's good money. And if you could, you and your family can work the dynamic out, it's, it's actually can be phenomenal money. But for me, it's just not, not what I wanted. So anyway, 2015, I finished my summer, I get my check, I'm pumped. And, uh, I just, it just, I just, something didn't feel right. And I'm like, I've just got to, if I do this one more year and I double again, mm-hmm. I'm never going to be able to walk away. And so right about that time, I really got into, ironically enough, podcasts. And I listened to a guy named James Altucher and he gave a piece of advice and he said, if you're looking to start a business and you don't know what you want to do, then write down 10 ideas a day for a year and you will have a business idea that will be worth pursuing. End of story. And so I, I remember that night I started and for eight months, um, six days a week, eight months. I couldn't do the seven. I had to give myself a day off. <laughs> right. I, I wrote down business ideas every single, like every single day when I was, uh, I mean, at Christmas day itself, when I was out selling for the summer, I'd get home at 11 o'clock at night. Didn't matter. I, I, I was committed to doing those 10 ideas. And so within eight months, I, I had an idea and and did you know it when that when the idea came? Was it like kind of like lightning striking? You're like, this is the idea, or no. did you have kind of a list that you were working from? How did yeah, that happen? Yeah, so no, I actually just did it for eight months. Kind of had two or three that I thought were really good, and then the the idea we initially had was let's build a an app for people to ship packages because on Facebook we're always seeing, hey, you're going from Salt Lake to St. George. Can someone take this for me and all that type of stuff? I'm like, let's build an app to make this easier for people, and so we. We thought it was this revolutionary idea, and in hindsight, it's just some, I mean, granted, it's not, it's a good idea, but there's so many people doing ideas similar. We just thought we had struck gold. Mm-hmm. And Because I do see did- that on, on Facebook. It's it's interesting, you know, I'm in uh, like Utah County. I think um, for our listeners, uh, Nick, you're in St. George, and right. I see that on Facebook all the time. Hey, is somebody going down to St. George this week or up north? Um, and looking for rides and different things. I see that all the time. So that's really interesting that you you notice that. So you were looking to um, do some type of shipping along those lines. We found out there's a company in Atlanta that had done it. And they're doing pretty well. They'd raise a bunch of money. And we, I personally kind of got discouraged. I'm thinking, well, there went our idea. And and my uh, soon-to-be partner at the time was like, dude, we, we should do this. I mean, it doesn't – like you know, you always turn and you're like, well, Google wasn't the first search engine. You're like, <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> You start talking to yourself like, yeah, that's that's true, and that's a little bit different scenario. But nonetheless, so we decided to do this. And so anyway, long story short, we took that idea. We started getting quotes and bids here here in St. George and across the state um, in California. And to our discouragement, we were getting bids anywhere between $80,000 and $150,000. And uh, that, that right there, that high barrier to entry – was one of the initial seeds that ended up morphing into uh, Colo, which turned into a platform to allow people to launch these ideas for a lot cheaper. So when you were going around, you were kind of going to uh, development shops saying, right. here's our idea. This is what we want to build. What is it going to take? What is it going to cost? And that was so expensive that it made you kind of rethink your strategy. Uh, that's You hit it on the head. That's exactly what it was. So w- what's funny is, we actually committed to building this app. We're like, well, that's such a good idea. Um, we'll just do it anyway. And so we figured out, we figured, hey, the, the plan was we can we have enough of the down payment and I'm gonna go out and I'm gonna sell another summer and then we're just gonna fund this. We ended up landing a meeting with uh, Angel Investor a couple days before this. So we were supposed to go out on a Monday, and this was a Thursday. We met with, by chance, an Angel Investor, which um, he he ended up just asking us some questions, some soul-penetrating questions about this idea. He's like, you know, I get pitched a lot, and I'm hearing 
this term Uber of like 25% of the time. So he kind of got instilled in our minds like, what if we build a platform that serviced all of those people? Since we don't really know that industry, we don't know the transportation industry, um, and we don't aren't great with tech, let's build these apps and we do know sales. So let's go and we'll, we'll just deploy that and, and we know sales and we'll just accumulate these customers and, and help them build their app. And so that's what it ended up. That's where we ended up. Gotcha. So you decided you're going to, you're going to fund this yourself. You've got a partner now. And was your partner someone who was also kind of had a sales background or did you bring on somebody that was on the technology side? So that, so there's, there's, there's the key is, um, I, I think that both of us, he and I both thought he had a sales background, (laughs) which I've learned, which I've learned. There's a difference between a salesman and a customer service person. Right. And I, I, if he's listening to this, this is something that he and I've talked about. So it's, it's no, not to his disrespect, but he had some experience, but it wasn't true sales experience. And so if you, I, I, my theory was if there's two, I'll take two good salespeople all day, then, and we'll be okay. We'll figure it out. But what ended up happening is it was, he didn't have that skill set, and he, I think he thought he did. And so long story short, um, that's that that was the that was the end of a, a few months into it. I ended up buying him out and uh, and just not seeing. There's just too. There just was kind of some dead weight there. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So so at this point, you buy at your partner and you are settled on this idea of building a platform and a, and a company that helps other people create their apps and get to market faster. At this point, is it just you by yourself, or did you have any other partners in the business at that point? So what I did is it, it currently, the, as far as it, in terms of equity and things like that, that's just me. But I went out and found somebody that I knew how to, that I knew personally knew how to sell because I had recruited this individual to sell door to door. And I, they were the best recruit I had in four years. Okay. And so, um, yeah, we recruit, I recruited him over to help me with the sales side of it, but like the actual sales side of it. Right. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, what's interesting about our company is we don't have, we have a, uh, we have, we're getting a lot of mentorship from people uh, from, in fact, this same particular individual that this angel investor that, um, helped us kind of plant the seed for this idea in terms of like on the tech side, cause he's, he's got a huge background in tech. So we've been fortunate there. He's kind of a partner without being a partner. Yeah. And how did you get in touch with him? You know, it was just kind of a string of different people. I, my, my just thing network is marketing was, basically. Yeah. Well, I, I, uh, I saw a video on Facebook and this guy, there's a specific guy named, uh, Brad Harker. Mm-hmm. He actually has a podcast, but he sold for Vivint and I saw a video. My mother-in-law sent me a video that he had posted about summer sales and I watched it and I was like, this is an interesting guy. He was able to get out of the industry. So prior to my last summer, I went out and chatted with, I met with him and chatted with him. And then he, it was through a referral from him that I met with a guy named Ever Gonzalez who had sold a, uh, a transportation company. And at that meeting, Ever brought this angel investor to the meeting. So it was it. super fluke. <laughs> well, that's, that's good. That's good timing. That's fantastic. <laughs> so then um, you, at this point now, you have um, an employee on board that you know has the sales experience that you need. You have a connection with an angel investor who's kind of mentoring you and, and getting you into the tech side. Um, so did you settle on um, a development company to help you to build out the product? No. So, we, so what, we, what we did is the same the, the the people that built our software um colo software are the same people that, that we've also that we're using to build our customers apps you guys are focusing a lot on um selling and and that process and using your other partner to develop the the code and the technical technical side of that to to bring it to your customers Correct. And he's, he's had a, he's had an exit or two with tech companies. He had a, a big dev shop. So he's, it, we've been very fortunate to have, have that expertise, that, that mentorship there. Absolutely. So what's the story behind the name Colo? Where did that come from? Well, the, the idea was the, the initial conversation was, um, all these startups, they pitch these ideas and really what they need is they need someone to help them 
incubate the idea. And because some of them are terrible and some of them are good, but we need to incubate these ideas and see which ones are good and which ones are bad. So what it means, it's spelled weird, but in Latin it means to foster. And so that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to take ideas and help foster them to market. Gotcha. So that really matches kind of your vision for the for the companies to help these companies, um, these ideas get to market and and to validate those that are good and uh, that can yeah, go I, on to be something bigger. I, exactly. And and my thought is, and my my true belief is, there's a lot of good ideas and a good companies that don't get started because it's such a high barrier to entry. Granted, when you lower it, you get a whole bunch of garbage with it. But I think that it's worth lowering to to get those maybe five to 10 good companies that everyone can benefit from and let the rest of them just fall off. And, and so basically it, we're like, Hey, here's, here's a way for you. If you're, if you have the audacity to say you're, you have this cool idea, like come, like it's cheap enough, come start your idea and go and let's, let's see it. Like if it's that good, let's see it. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. Make it happen. So, um, you're still a relatively young company looking back. What do you see as your big break so far that you've had with Colo? Big break was we spent a couple of weeks, I think right around six, I think six weeks, six to eight weeks with one customer. And granted, this customer was paying us a, a good chunk of money, but one customer, we just kept doing doing the, the repetitions and everything else. And within there, there hit a point where we're like, man, something's got to give. And then within 10 days, we were able to get an additional four customers. So that was our big break. And then it was like, crap, now we got to figure out how to onboard these guys. <laughs> right. Now, now the problem is you've, you've sold and you need to need to bring them on board and, and make all of it happen and follow through. Exactly. So a huge break. I, I attribute it to just, it's just the sales cycle. Like software is different than selling alarms. There's, it's a longer process. You have to figure out how to build relationships. And two of our customers, we have been able to mine from from uh, Facebook and Instagram, and I'm talking like cold call, Facebook cold call, and finally after four months, was we were able to acquire one of them. It's like the craziest thing that you can get. You can get paying customers from Facebook. Still blows me away. Wow, that's that's amazing. So just persistence, basically finding somebody, uh, a customer that you felt felt you know fit your product, and just being persistent and making it happen. So have you had any scary moments so far um, with your company where you thought, you know, what you'd built so far might fail? Uh, you know, you mentioned the kind of the pivot with the mad freight with the shipping idea to oh. doing colo. Since you've shifted to colo, have you had any had any experiences where, where something happened that made you think, wow, I don't know if we're going to be able to, to make it through this? And if you did, how did you overcome that? So, man, during that time when we had one customer, we were definitely questioning ourselves and thinking, you wouldn't, I mean, we're asking ourselves like, yeah, we got a customer. We got that customer quick. Like we had contracts, we had contracts like January one and we had that customer within two weeks and we're like, oh, this is going to be easy, you know, All right, we're going to kill this. <laughs> and uh, so that was, that was tough. What we did though is that made us get really, really creative. And so we started getting extremely creative about different verticals and different industries that we could get into thinking what if this like this startup like we're, we're focused on startups what if this is just a waste of time so we got really creative and it really came up with some good strategies in different industries in the meantime just kind of like as a as a defense mechanism like what if this is this is bad and so because of that we, we, we're, we're still exploring those and what we may end up doing, we're exploring some different uh, verticals where we can get in, we can figure out what the pain points are, we can build this platform to really service that particular niche and then we just go and hit as many of those companies and those customers as we can and then move on to the next one and keep expanding this platform which we kind of view, if you picture it, it's kind of like an engine that we can either bring people on and build ideas off of this engine or or use this engine to build ideas or if we see an opportunity in the industry we can use our tools and and our network and our and these different things to build products in industries and start companies in industries for virtually nothing and then find people to put in charge of these companies and we can kind of have this network of companies with some really cool products 
that we've built in a short, short amount of time for virtually nothing. Do you have any advice for other entrepreneurs that might be listening to the podcast that are either considering starting their own thing or just have that entrepreneurial itch? Any advice for them? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So uh, I wish I would have started like three years ago. Mm -hmm. So my, here's my thinking is, you know, I made some good money doing, doing, uh, door to door sales and all that stuff. And I learned a great skill set. And, but truly, I think that, let's say I learned, like, of all the sales skills I learned in four years, I think I learned 90% of it within two. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I got better, of course, those last two years. But, I think that had I started two years earlier and not been scared and I would have started writing down ideas and just been more proactive that way and just taking the jump, I, the experience I could have got from a startup in two years, I can't even imagine. Like it, What I've learned in six months doesn't even compare. Four years of door knocking, which you can argue you can learn a lot door knocking. Yeah. But in six months of a startup, like you, I'm learning things and meeting people and – and th- things that I never imagined or never thought I'd have to think about. And so like, it's crazy how much it's blowing my mind that the, the learning curve is steep. So my, my only regret is that I didn't do it earlier. Mm-hmm. Wow, that's awesome. So, yeah, I mean, to go along with that, it's like, what's the worst case scenario? For me, it was like, if I go and I fail, I can always go and sell. So Nick, have you had any sort of funny learning experiences or mistakes along the way with your startup kind of in the middle all of the mistakes happen in my opinion when things start to go get a little tough and so we hit that stage where we we had one customer and we're starting to question ourselves and we're thinking what is going on and so we got really creative as i told you and some of the creativity was good and some of it was bad and one of our ideas was let's quit trying to go after ones and twos and like just go after like individual people and let's go and find people that have networks. So let's go and network with all these different people across the state and across the country that supposedly should have these clients of ours, you know, that know them. Look for bigger sales opportunities. Yeah. And so, so we're thinking, okay, we tried to reverse engineer the process. Well, the people that know them are probably these guys that have these big events and like they probably need to be in certain geographical locations and all this stuff. So we planned this huge road trip and, it, it, we we actually did it, and we it consisted of us going to Vegas, and then from Vegas we went down to uh, L.A., and then from L.A. we turned around and through the night like heroes. We we drove up to Salt Lake to an event, and I mean it just it, I mean we the, what the sad part is is we did this trip, and I mean we were trying to tell ourselves that it was a, a productive trip when we didn't meet anybody, and. Uh, so we get back and we go and we have our regular meeting with with this mentor slash angel investor and he got wind that we had gone to the, some of these events and it was just it just reminded me so much of a conversation with my dad like dude did you really <laughs> like did you really do that son tell me, tell me you so, didn't go and do this <laughs> yeah and it was more of it it was more it was more phrase like so how was that event like and that's it and it was like it had me like scratching my head for like two weeks. I'm like, dude, that guy probably had such high hopes for me. You know, it just, I just ruined all of my, <laughs> so <laughs> what I learned through that is like, it, it's so easy when you get into a startup to just tell yourself you're doing productive stuff, but like that wasn't productive at all. And we just thought it would be, it just, I think we just felt cool. <laughs> mm, right. Right. <laughs> you know, I, it's as shamed as I am to admit it. We just thought it was cool. But then we're, we're sitting across from a guy that has a net worth that I have no idea what it is, but it's a lot more than mine. And lots of zeros. <laughs> yeah, lots of zeros. And he's essentially looking at me like that was dumb, you know. <laughs> so yeah, that's that's it. that's one of my that's one of my uh, not not so proud moments. Let's just say that. <laughs> but hey, at least you went down swinging for the fences, right? That's a that's a that, good that's a good thing, and l- you learned something <laughs> from it, right? And we felt cool for a little while. Yeah. <laughs> So when you decided to make the jump to starting your own company, were there challenges along the way or what is it? Was it a pretty smooth transition for you? There was, I thought it would be a lot smoother. Um, anyone that's listening right now, that's in an industry or in a job that they're doing really well at, they're probably surprisingly and ironically enough, they're going to be the ones that have, that may go through this. And so 
I mean, I came from an industry and a job where I, f- I felt like I was doing pretty well and I statistically knew what I was doing and I was making great money and I had all this confidence and thought I was the man, you know? Mm-hmm. And then I jump into a startup and I'm all of a sudden, I'm zero, like I'm nothing. And no one cares. Like, okay, cool. You sold however many million of dollars worth of alarm. Like it doesn't, it's not relevant to this venture capitalist that I'm talking to right now. He doesn't care anymore. Yeah. In a way you're starting over from, from ground zero. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you are. And, And it's almost like it's, it was this really weird thing. Like I've never struggled with confidence. My wife would attest to that. In fact, <laughs> anyone I know would attest to that. And I, I consider it one of my strengths. But this literally had me question myself because, like I said, I, I went from being very successful and being the top. And now I'm like, I got to make a name. And so there got, I mean, it was bad. It, it, it got to the point where I would try and dodge scenarios and conversations where I knew people would ask me about my business and, and like, because I would worry what they were thinking and I just had this kind of weird couple of weeks where I was just wor- I was just overthinking it. But yeah, so if you're talking about struggles, even me, like it, <laughs> and you'd have to know me to know that that's pretty powerful. So I, yeah, I had a huge struggle with confidence for a little while. And then the way that I solved that is I just started doing, I just tried to, my best to do hard things because when you do hard things, you get confidence and then when you have confidence everything's smooth so I just tried to do things that were extremely tough for me that like kind of scared me a little bit and then that gave me confidence and then boom when we hit the the four additional customers in that 10 day span everything was back so mm-hmm. um, yeah be, be ready I, I don't know if yours is going to be confidence but if you think it's going to be smooth and maybe if you jump in to entrepreneurship and it's smooth You should write a book on it because you figured it out. (laughs) I don't think it is for anybody. All right, Nick, thanks so much for joining us this week on Founder Story. I really appreciate your time. Where can people go to get more information about Colo? Yeah, hey, thanks so much, Dan. It's been a pleasure. Um, Anywhere on social media, if you you look up Nick, my handle is Nick Colo, N-I-C-K-K-H-O-L-O. Right, that's it. Nick's interview reminded me how important salesmanship is and how much a great salesperson can lift your company. Thank you for listening. Subscribe now. Next week's episode is going to be really good. I'm so excited for our guest. If you like the show, please give us five stars on iTunes and leave a review. You can also find us at founderstorypodcast.com and on Instagram at founderstorypodcast. See you next week.